Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suche doye olahudi san miao san putoshe. Wu Shang Shan Shan Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wu Jin Chen Wan De Shou Chi Yan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in hundreds of thousands of millions of eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it, Within my sight and hearing, I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Gui Shishung, Dadia Omitofo. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, uh, could we take that up just a touch to get rid of the echo, but a little bit louder? This is uh, June 15th. We're here at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, and welcome to everybody this evening. If you're joining us online, um, welcome as well. We're going to be uh, looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka. Yeah, that's just right. The Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, but we've had a, a scheduling situation whereby tomorrow is the uh, observance of our teachers entering Nirvana, and uh, six. Oops, just lost it. That's funny. 60% of our community is up at City of 10,000 Buddhas tonight uh, preparing for tomorrow because as the calendar works itself out, this has become, over the years, the most attended event at City of 10,000 Buddhas. And more people show up for this occasion than any other event on the calendar. So in order to provide for all of those guests, uh, Many of our community was, were drafted to go up and, and uh, help out. So tonight, those of you who did come are very sincere, and you have to listen loudly. Listen for two of you, all right? Listen with four ears so that uh, we can fill in the gaps here. Now, the other thing is that we uh, will be heading out early ourselves to that event. So we'll probably finish tonight at 9 instead of our usual 9.30. So... Um, We'll just slide everything forward half an hour. And uh, begin with chanting the name of the sutra and the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. You'll find it right here on the cover of the text. We'll, we'll chant it in Chinese. It's an invocation. So this is an opportunity to invoke spiritual presence. And what we're doing is we are, th the translation is there on the cover, we're chanting the name of the text, and also the uh, the speakers of the text and the assembly that came to to protect it. So the the flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Namo Ta Fang Guang Fo Hua Yen Jing Hua Yen Hai Hui Po Pu Sa Namo Ta Fang Guang Fo Hua Yen Jing Hua Yen Hai Hui Fo Pu Sa Nam Ta Fang Guang Fo Hua Yen Jing Hua Yen Hai Hui Fo Pu Sa Namo da fang guang fo hua yen jing hua yen hai hui pu sa 
Hu da fang wang fu hua yen ji Hua yen hai hui fu bu sa Na mu da fang wang fu hua yen ji Hua yen hai hui fu bu sa So we're delighted that our varsity high-tech team is here to guide us out into cyberspace. Those of you joining us online, we missed by that much not bringing you any broadcast at all, luckily. We have nimble folks who found the answer, and we are back online, so pleased about that. In order to, as, as this lecture series has grown over the years, um, and we started in 95, mind you, uh, we have gradually increased in sophistication and subtlety, by goodness, so that now, um, although physically, we're, uh, we have a, a core of faithful attendees who come and listen to this 2,500-year-old text being rendered in English, there are occasions when the people joining us online from around the world outnumber the physical bodies here. So that's pretty amazing. And the, um, <coughs> it comes bit by bit, step by step, as we um, establish our presence online as well. Using this method to propagate the Dharma was unimaginable. That is to say, in your imagination, you did not imagine such a, didn't happen, these ideas that I could be sitting here uh, talking in Berkeley, California on a Saturday night and folks uh, in Gold Coast, Australia could be dialing in and in, uh, although we moved it on, we used to be receivable and visible in Beijing, but the streaming turned out to be best on YouTube. And so when we migrated to YouTube, we lost our Chinese listeners. They can probably get it via iTunes download, but they can't stream it live. So, by golly, we'll see how that shakes out. Um, but people all over the world are able to join in, and that's lovely. Now we've upped our, uh, the tools that we're using. We have fancy zoom lenses on our video cam so that... Uh, when we first started out years ago on something called uh, uh, Pal, Pal Chat, Pal Talk, Pal Talk, that was the beginning. And uh, the computer used to be up on the balcony so that we were both, we had a Vietnamese translation, a Mandarin, tra I did the Mandarin and English duties, uh, 15 minutes of Mandarin, 15 minutes of English. And bit by bit, kind of organically, the, the people who needed to hear Mandarin got fewer and fewer. So... As a result, my translations into Mandarin got scantier and scantier until we actually had a complaint. Arma Master, you're skimping all the good stories. You don't translate the good stories into Mandarin anymore. You're forcing us to learn English so we can get the jokes. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, that's true. And I just realized that that was not my intention, but that's what happened because as I was telling the jokes getting the punchlines in Chinese, the heads that were nodding and laughing were fewer and fewer. So it's kind of organically, we just morphed over to English only um, online. Pal Talk became um, the, the, we moved to the service that Grace Cathedral, Grace Com was using, which turned out to be quite expensive. Um, we were paying by the, by the, the bit uh, to go out into cyberspace. Then we moved to Ustream, um, which required you to see commercials. And apparently you couldn't turn them off. And uh, we're lecturing on a sacred text of the Mahayana tradition. And people on the chat room would say, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's a little uh, jarring to be listening to the event, the, the uh, Resolve of the Bodhisattva as he is moved by compassion to benefit living beings, followed immediately by a soap commercial. 
uh, detergent and the Bodhi Resolve don't mix all that well. And that's when it was good, when they moved to Suntory Whiskey and Johnny, label, Johnny Walker Black Label, they said, no, can't we switch, get another service? So we did. We now found that um, Ustream streaming, uh, YouTube streaming is very satisfactory, backed by Google's servers. And so now we have uh, um, a, I'm told that uh, our, our image the actual streaming image is quite, uh, quite okay to watch. And mind you, our bandwidth, our, our uh, what do you say, our production needs are pretty narrow because why? I sit still. <laughs> I don't even dance, you know, much less sing. I do sing, but that's even though it's like an acu acoustic guitar, I don't even plug in my guitar. How analog could we be? This is distinctly old-fashioned. old, stash, old fashioned, so. Anyway, the result being that uh, the Buddha's words are going out um, over the interwebs to, into your PC at home, and that's pretty amazing. And the reason I'm bringing this all up and tell you the history is that it takes a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. There are many hands at work here setting this up and maintaining the signal and the beam and... An example tonight was we found that we were logged on to a similar account, but not the actual account that looked different except by one, uh, one s several letters in the email address. And that, the, that account was closed to us. No streaming. Until someone with sharp eyes said, oh, that's not the actual address. We switched over and ah, now we're back onto the, the internet. How, how difficult is it to get all of that in line, all of the ducks lined up? And um, every time this happens, I have to tell you, I confess, um, I am completely aware of the fragility of those conditions that allows all of this to take place so that not only those of you sitting here can hear it and see it, but those... Uh, abroad, uh, even as far away as Oakland, California. There are some people who say, you know, it's just too much trouble to get in the car and drive to Berkeley. I just log on. Where are you watching from? Uh, MacArthur Boulevard? You know, oh, okay, cool. So um, that's fine. As if your, your mind is here listening in, then um, the distance is negligible. It's not a given that any of this happens. I'm aware, as I say, I confess that at any moment, I know that if we pulled the plug, if suddenly the grid went down, if a great sunspot happened and blanked out everybody's hard drive, the lecture would go on. I'm ready to just raise my voice, pick up the text and say, join me please on page 24 and 25, if you will. Can you find it there? And this lecture would continue because why? That's the way the Buddha did it, and that's the way Master Hua, our founder, did it. Absolutely not dependent upon any of those newfangled, fancy gizmos and contraptions. Fundamentally, the Dharma happens in your heart. And uh, I am here to open this text and to uh, point us together. I'm, I'm kind of like a traffic cop, just saying, here's where we're going. Come with me now, back to the time of Confucius, the time of, mm, who else was alive? Plato and Socrates. Come back to the time of Lao Tzu, uh, 25 centuries ago when these texts were first spoken. And now we've got a very lovely Chinese, English, Vietnamese, version of this text in your hands, which is a miracle all by itself. So with all those conditions being present, let's see if we can focus our, our consciousness um, here on June 15, 2013, um, onto the, the principles that the Buddha explained and see if we can't make these come alive in our, in our 21st century lives. 
We are on the last paragraph, the last stanza down at the bottom. And to honor the Chinese source that brought these to us here in California in the 21st century, we chant the Chinese first. And we're in a section of the text that is called the verse repetition. This is the Chong Song section. The, the Avatamsaka is set out with text first and verses following. The text is prose, it's sentences, grammatical as we are used to them. And then the same principles return in verse form. So bringing all the virtues of verse with it, that is to say short, essential. Um, not rhyming but metered. So it goes ba bump ba bump ba bump um, four times, seven characters per, per line. And it's the same principles repeated and made essential, really shrunk down to the essence. So that's, that's where we are. And you'll notice when you turn over to page 27, that's it. That's the end of the fourth ground. We're almost done with this fourth of 10 sections. In Sanskrit, this is called the Dashabhumi. Dashabhumika, the ten grounds, the ten stages. Um, it's a chapter that is two-thirds of the way through the entire sutra. This is a chunk of a text that's this big. No exaggeration, it's that big. It's predicted that when this is completely translated over into English, with the commentary, we will be looking at a hundred-volume work. What does a hundred volumes look like? Looks like that, right? Those brown volumes back there with the uh, gold vertical binding, that's a hundred volumes in Chinese. This one over here, that's 150 volumes. So um, what are we gonna do? That's dysfunctional in the 21st century. Who's gonna you know, get the entire bound version in English, a hundred volumes of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Well, some of you go, Dharma Master, I can fit that under one thumb drive, right? Yeah, good, and we hope you will. I can put that on my iPod with room for songs and movies. Yep, I hope so. However, um, don't depend on the electronic versions. If we, um, first of all, the answer is produce it, translate it, right? Let's see the printed copy. We're working on that. And uh, it will be whether it'll happen in our lifetime is a question, but certainly that's our intention. So meanwhile, here we are looking at the end of the fourth ground, the fourth stage of what? Of the Bodhisattva's path. And we'll explain that in just a bit. First of all, let's, let's meet the, tonight's text. It's down at the bottom, and those of you who don't read Chinese characters, look at the Romanized script. Does everybody have a copy? If you, and if you want one, we have them, certainly. Um, we can put one in your hands if you don't have one. Okay. Um, the Romanized Chinese is there below the characters. We're on page 24 and 25. Um, it has tone marks, you'll notice. For example, the next to the bottom line begins with P, U, Pu, and that angular mark going from left to right upwards is a tone. Chinese, the modern Mandarin, spoken in China, in Taiwan, in Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and wherever the Chinese diaspora went out over the world, um, has four tones, and then a neutral tone. So this is pu, that's the second tone, the rising tone. Sa, fourth tone, falling tone, pu sa. So it proceeds like that, P-U-S-A-Q-I-N, right? So those of you who don't read the, the Chinese graphs, the characters above, can follow along, should you choose to, with the Romanized Chinese. And we're gonna start that way. We we chant the Chinese first. Um, if you can read the, the Han Zi, the Kanji, the characters, good on you, and, and please do. Um, if 
neither of those interests you, then we've got the English, which follows right along afterwards. All right, so I'm going to put my palms together. These are verses. They were originally chanted with a chant tone. Um, so we're going to give a little melody to it. Here we go. Pusa chin shio bu shi dai. Go ahead. Pusa chin shio bu shi dai. Chi de shi xin jie ju zu. Chi de shi xin jie ju zu. Chuan chiu fo dao wu yan juan. Over to the right, uh, let's do it in unison. Can we read together? Here we go. The Bodhisattva cultivates diligently. He is never lax or lazy. He promptly obtains ten mind sets and perfects them all. Intently seeking Buddhahood, he never tires nor worries. Determined to ascend to rescue living beings. All right. Um, the Bodhisattva, it means awakened being, someone who is awakened. And that implies, of course, that before he was awakened, he was asleep. And from the Buddhist point of view, that's the case. We, he would include that pronoun, we are asleep until we wake up. What are we asleep to? little reality check here. Where did I come from? Mm. If you're Catholic, who made you? God made me, say the Catholics, when you, do, when you recite the catechism. Uh, someone else will say, I came from mom. I know where I came from, and I came from Dad. Father's Day is upon us. So that's good, yes. Um, your body did. But when your body passes on, where did you come from? Where did you go? Mm, you don't know. I don't know. I speak for myself. I don't know. And that, the Buddha would say, is called being asleep. There you go. Um, who dreamt last night? I don't know. You remember the dreams? Yes, I do. Uh, I recall those dreams. And I know I was dreaming. Um, and were the dreams more real than the reality I woke to? Yeah, at the time, yes. Why don't I recall? Because I'm not awake. So it doesn't take much to, to point out um, the covers on the mind, which is what the Buddha was talking about. A bodhisattva wakes up to those. They're no longer in the dark. What covers my mind right this minute, the Buddha said, generically is called ignorance. Wu Ming, no light. Sanskrit, avijja, right? <coughs> avijja, ah, uh, not awake, not lit, not illuminated. So there we are. We're at that state, essentially, existentially asleep with our eyes open. So, living beings, we, are asleep with our eyes open. So, the Buddha, if you think, that plugs directly into the founding story, doesn't it? What did Prince Siddhartha realize in that fateful trip out of the pleasure dome of his palace into the city where he went um, with his driver to see the world? He saw what he had been asleep to before, that things don't last. Essentially, what the prince woke up to was impermanence. Wu Chang, a Nietzsche, right? That, that principle. And different from many of us, he couldn't be content with that. He didn't just say, uh-huh, that's how it is. I'm going back to the palace because why there's a party tonight. He didn't. He couldn't be peaceful with that. He said, I got to know. I can't stay asleep. I'm determined to wake up. And that 
resolution, that resolve in his mind was what led to our sitting here tonight. So the Bodhisattva in our text here is someone, anyone, and it's deliberately generic. There's no face on our Bodhisattva. And for that reason, your face fits. Can be male, can be female, can be young, can be old can come with a variety of accents, skin colors, economic status, political parties, doesn't matter. Old, modern, not yet to come, past, present, future beings can put their face over the bodhisattva and fit. So it's a generic faceless bodhisattva who on this fourth stage, this fourth ground, cultivates diligently. And the text has some, some rubrics. The text has some structures that we go through. One of them is the ten grounds follow what are called the ten paramitas, the ten perfections. And the fourth one of those is always vigor. Sanskrit virya, strength. The French say force du frappe. It's just coming at it again one more time. Once more, dear friends, the Bodhisattva on the fourth stage works hard, vigorous, doesn't give up easily, right? Applies him or herself again. The Bodhisattva cultivates diligently. She is never lax or lazy, all right? We spent, as we went into this text, we talked about what is real vigor. When does it become obsession? When does vigor become obsessive compulsive? That's important to know. The answer is as soon as it leaves the middle way. The the Buddha's path is moderation, but that moderation is a moving middle. It's not a fixed center. For example, there are people who would tell you that eating a plant-based harmless diet is extreme. People for whom the habit of consuming flesh as their source of nutrition um, is normal well okay yes granted for many folks and so from that point of view if if the middle is situated here then removing flesh from your diet would be no longer the middle that's an extreme from the point of view of a vegetarian or a plant-based eater someone who's plant strong they would say no it's my standard is now my middle. So the middle shifts, right? For someone who is used to consuming a pint of ale every afternoon at 4 p.m., like my ancestors in Ireland, or more than one pint, you know, black beer, fill them up again, lads. To not do so is extreme. So it's a moving middle, right? So the Dharma, never lax or lazy, what does that mean? Well, What do you do with the fact that I've never eaten breakfast for 37 years? Not bragging, it's a fact. And the other monks and nuns in my order eat once a day at noon. And while I will never win a beauty contest, and people would say, you know, you're too skinny. On the other hand, when you do look at my blood stats, I'm pretty healthy. Not you know, knocking on wood and taking all the protections from bold statements like that, you know. Um, As soon as you say it, something happens, right? uh, That's superstition. My Irish grandparents would say, no, it's the Lord's truth, you know. So um, what about that? Where's the middle if I fast 23 hours a day for 37 years, as do my colleagues? That's funny, that's a different middle. Now, recommended? Not necessarily. I have lots of practices that support that. And there be some people who say, well, the monk can do it, we can do it too. Not, not recommended. If I were in the world raising kids, driving to work every day and trying to put up with the stress of the workplace, I would need more nutrition, more, more food in my body. But I lead the life of a mendicant, of a meditator, and I have very different demands on my body. For me to put food in my stomach every morning and every night 
my meditation would be profoundly affected. Let me tell you how wonderful it is to cross your legs in the morning and have your whole system be quiet. To not have these chemicals going right? The, and in the evening as well. It's very different. We have this wonderful practice in the Mahayana called the uh, Eightfold Precepts. Bhagwan idea, the Eightfold Fast. And they're I'm not going to digress into those, but just to say, there, one of them is to not eat after noon. The, the eightfold fasting day precepts are the ten precepts of the Shramanera, the novice monk or the Shramanerika, compressed into eight. And the last of them is to, uh, to stop eating at noon like our Theravada brothers and sisters do. And everybody reports who takes these precepts, you, you endeavor to take them for 24 hours, one day and one night. The, uh, everybody who does these reports that the next morning after you stop eating at noon, that means you simply eliminate one dinner and one breakfast. The next morning, the meditation is uncommonly Quiet. Do at the ten day vipassana do you eat stop eating at noon? Yeah. So people who do the ten day vipassana, Goenka style, know that feeling of how quiet things are the next morning, and it's so um, logically evident that when you don't put stuff in your stomach, where does the energy that would go to the digestive process go? It goes evenly out to the mind, to the nerves, to the muscles. Things are quiet. And the result is your meditation has a lot more focus and a sense of lightness and ease. So to do that day in and day out is suitable for monastics in a monastery, not so for lay people trying to live their lives in the busy marketplace. So just to say, not so extraordinary when you look at the the surrounding ecosystem that supports reducing food intake to one meal a day. It was indeed the Buddha's practice to eat alms food, whatever he was given, in his bowl once a day. So we're attempting to maintain that. But that's neither here nor there. Just to say, moving middle. What is the middle way? What is moderation for you? That's a good question. Can we start by coming back to simplicity? That's a really good way. How do you manage to let go of things that are excessive? Well, I remember when I was eating three meals a day, often that dinner, would I would swallow that dinner thinking, I'm not really hungry. And maybe this, I don't need this. I'm kind of eating because it's a habit. And often my body would not want that food. And yet, it's dinner time. Dinner is a very social event. You, the food's on the table, dig in. And I would chew it mindlessly, even without my body saying, mm, this is good, I need this fuel. And often I would think I'm fogged in because of this food it had an effect on my mind as well. Um, there would be one place, if that, now that was my experience, if that connects with you, maybe that's one way. Eat when you're hungry. That can make a difference. Um, some folks, there's all kinds of creative, healthy ways to look at the intake of nutrition. There was one, one called the one bowl practice. Some, an author, I forget his name, who wrote a book called One Bowl. And his way of finding a new middle was to eat only things that would fit into a single bowl. Now, it wasn't a tiny bowl. He wasn't being, you know, wasn't testing himself that way. It was a substantial bowl. But the idea was my awareness of the nu nutritional needs of my body 
are going to be satisfied by this round container and fill up the bowl, sit down and eat. If you're still hungry, go do it again, the same bowl, and be aware that this container sustains my life. So that's a very lovely way to do it because why? The next step is, where did this food come from? I wonder who produced this broccoli, this tofu, this rice. And hmm, I'm grateful. I'm aware. So immediately gratitude arises as you connect with the, the contents of that bowl. And it creates a connection with the process of fueling your body. And he reports, the writer reports, all of the goodness that arises from this is such things as pretty soon you start to slow down as you chew because you realize, hmm, this is my food. That bowl and my stomach are kind of similar, you know, and I just move it from this bowl to that container. Here, hmm, I'm nourishing my body with the earth around me. How lovely, and there's a lot of hands involved in bringing this food to the place where I consume it. So suddenly this process of, very mundane process of chewing food connects to the world around you and just by the process of eating it in one bowl. Pretty soon you start to eat a little less and you certainly eat less mindlessly. The bites you chew are kind of, yeah, thank you, you know. There's earth, air, fire, and water. It's, it's a gift in this stuff that I magically transform into energy. So much wholesome contemplation arises from this um, one bowl practice. That's just one, you know, one way. Um, you all, I'm sure, have, are in touch with a, a variety of ways to, to bring more conscious awareness to this practice of eating. So that's one. And the middle shifts, this middle of what was before normal, now gets charged with awakening in life and it becomes one of the best parts of the day. So the bodhisattva is never lax or lazy. Every moment is an opportunity to go back to a deeper connection, to go from the branch tips to the, to the branches, and the branches to the trunk, from the trunk to the roots, and from to the roots to the whole forest. So that's how our bodhisattva wakes up. And she, we're going to change our pronoun. She promptly obtains 10 mindsets and perfects them all. Okay, those of you who were with us when we first went through the prose will recall that the bodhisattva... Um, Turn to page four and five. Tens, the number 10 is a big number in our sutra, in the Avatamsaka Sutra. It's one of the hallmarks of this text that makes it different from other of the Buddha sutras. And it's called... Uh, the teaching of totality is one of the, the names that the Avatamsaka gained over the years. It's, it's also about uh, perfection. And ten is a magical numeral in uh, mathematics and geometry and algebra and all. In the building blocks of, of mathematics, ten is a new beginning, right? It's one again. You go from zero to nine and you have 10 numerals, and then you take one more, and you start again, 11, 12, 13, and up. So 10 is the end and the beginning again, numerically, mathematically. So um, in this text, we're always running into lists of 10. 10 this, 10 that. 10 visions, 10 resolves, 10 vows, and each of the grounds, we're on ground number four, has ten hearts. It's the Chinese word xin. Uh, let's see here. Is it xin in this case? 
No, it's not. They are the ten things here are are the we we use the word ten in our verse tonight. He prompt ji da shi xin. He promptly gets ten xin. That word xin, I flip back now to page twenty-five and keep your finger in four and five because we're going to come back. The ten xin, this word xin in Chinese, it's on uh, page twenty-four, over on the right-hand side of the second line from the bottom. That's an actual picture of a heart, the actual heart organ, with the the aorta and the vena cava and the the various. Um, arteries and veins. That's the the that's one of the pictograms, and on one hand, um, it's talking about the organ, the actual physical heart organ that's beating in your chest right now. But the Chinese figured that the Xin is where the thinking happens. They didn't go like this. They didn't point here. They would say, "Here, I'm thinking about it." And interestingly enough, when they said "me," the Chinese go here, the opposite of us. They go, "I'm think, I'm I'm walking here, I'm walking here. Get out of my way." If you're in New York, that's how you talk. Take it, from me. Phil. Is that accurate? But nah, my accent. I, I'm practicing. Yeah, I, that was a Brooklyn accent. But if I was in Yonkers, I'd say it different. I know, I know. So I'm walking here. The Chinese would go like that. I'm walking here. Although they wouldn't say that, they would say, or the Japanese would go, "Sa, onegai shimasu." Different culture. Okay, please. So, the thinker lives here, but the self lives here in the Chinese world. In the West, it's kind of me and I think here. You know, smart guys in Brooklyn. Yeah, they would say. So, how funny. That we identify different spots in the body with the thinking process. It's true, cultural difference. So, what is it about the, that the bodhisattva gets? The bodhisattva gets ten of those. What are they? Ten xin. Ten hearts? No, he can't fit ten hearts in his chest. It's obviously not the organ. But what what is he talking about here? We translated it as mind sets because we. Ran through a whole list of English possible translations for Xin, and we had Gestalts, we had psyches, we had perspectives, we had ideas, notions, um, perceptions. We went through a, a long list of words, psychological and uh, psycho-spiritual, and came up with mindset because these are more than thoughts. That same word "shin" is used sometimes to talk about thoughts, but these are not thoughts. They're a little deeper down the tree of the thinking process. We use mindsets, because why? What does the prose tell us? I'm back on four and five now. These are contemplations. In this case, in the third ground they're different. In the fifth ground they're different. The bodhisattva gets ten. Page fourteen. These are a second list. Yeah, there's more than one.、Uh, Helen is pointing out that on page 14 we have another list of ten, and that's because we have,、uh, as we go up the grounds. If you go, first is bottom and ten is top. It gets, it grows in complexity. We have more than one. Here, back on page four and five. These are, I think that's what our verse is talking about today.、Um, you could probably use the 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 shin on page fourteen and explain it as well, but what the bodhisattva is doing on page four and five is a mindset that Guan he's contemplating here. Well. Helen, we'll go back to fourteen and take a look at it. There are ten guan that the bodhisattva uses. Now, this is 
important here because the bodhisattva is looking in. He's using a inner vision. Guan is the word that was used for vipassana when it's talking about a meditative technique. What is he doing? He looks at ten things. But he's looking not only with his eyes or with her eyes. He's looking with his shin, his heart. So how do you look with your heart? Mm, interesting question. You contemplate. What is a contemplation? A contemplation builds on things you see, but it's referring to another horizon, you could say. It's referring to an inner vision. Measuring by things that are visual, but also deeper. What is he contemplating? Take a look. The Bodhisattva is contemplating realms, big things. So, Roberto, you're saying the, the one I pointed you to in the verse. Which, which one is the other one? What, what page? Okay. <laughs> we have a Chinese class happening here. This is great. Okay. Which line? Which line on page 14? Okay, okay. Good. Keep going up. Keep going up to the middle paragraph. There's, there's the sheen there. They're laughing at you, Rabindu. These Chinese girls are giggling at you, you know. Because you and I both saw Chinese characters and went, wow, you're, you're knocking on the door that I entered to meet the Buddha Dharma, which is, what are those? They are fascinating. These are fascinating scripts that have been in human consciousness for six, seven, eight thousand years. All right. Now, let me point you to page 14, okay? I've been laughed at a lot. By, wait till I start speaking Vietnamese. Then the laughter really, oh man. Okay, so page 14, middle paragraph, right? First word is Fozi, right? F O Z I. Okay, look down to the next line. And you go, Ru Shi Ar De Run Zi Xin. Is that the one you're looking at? You following me? From the top, it's line one, two, three, four, five in the Chinese. The first word is Dao Fun. In, okay, go over to the right. Ru Shi Ar De Run Zi Xin. Now, you're seeing extra. Did you, when, when did you have your eyes checked last? No, no, no. no. Okay, the other one you're pointing to is which one? Lock, which one? A different font? Which different font? Oh, oh, the layout is a different font. Oh, man. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's Microsoft's fault. It, it blame Bill Gates, man. He, he, he'll take it. You know why? It's two different Chinese fonts. You are, in fact, your eyesight is excellent. <laughs> you picked out the font difference, man. Well done. I know, I know. That is worth laughing at. For sure. Oh, you know what it was? Because it's verse in English, this is italicized. 
So they matched that with the Chinese. Same character, two different fonts. How about that? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Who's paying attention? Roberto. <laughs> All right. Same word. Same word. Hallelujah. Boy, we... Okay, now I was back with Guan. <laughs> Remember Guan? How long ago were we talking? So the Bodhisattva looks within using another, the inner kind of vision to look at realms, right? Now, what, what is... We could finish the lecture talking about realms tonight because that's a very big thing. Is it a universe? Is it a galaxy? Is it... Uh, the Hubble Black, what was the name of that that we talked about last week? Where the Hubble telescope pointed into a black zone in space and discovered 100 million trillion infinite galaxies in this place where they didn't think anything was there. So, a realm could be any of those. But, let's look, what are they? The Bodhisattva, what are the mindsets that he gets? He contemplates the realms of living beings, humans, polar bears, caterpillars, birds, kookaburras, wrens, microbes, ancestors, all these realms of living beings, sentient creatures. Contemplates the realms of dharma. Where is that? Everywhere the mind goes, there are dharmas. Contemplates the realms of worlds. Okay, now we're getting out there into the cosmos. How do you define a world? Sun and a moon, a polar mountain, Mount Sumeru, four seas, four continents, etc. The realms of space. Suddenly, we're talking big. The realm of space, it exists where things are not. It exists in your skin pores, in your blood cells. Space. So, you get it, right? The Bodhisattva works with these contemplations. These are the mindsets that he is looking at in order to prepare his mind to learn the fourth ground, the teachings of the fourth ground. What's going on? She's expanding her mind. She's getting big so that the information that's coded into this fourth ground will go in and take root. If we are contemplating the realms of lunch, right? Worse, if we're contemplating the realms of dessert, we're looking at the dessert menu, we're contemplating whether to get a soy latte with a double shot or to go with the house blend, that's a different size realm, right? That's the realm of the tongue. So the Bodhisattva says, yeah, there is a time for the realm of the tongue, but I'm expanding it to look at living beings, to look at dharmas, worlds, space, the realm of consciousness. That's going to put my mind in the, the appropriate size to learn what I have to learn in the fourth ground. Why? Here's the key. You could say the, it's the backstory that makes sense here. This bodhisattva saw suffering. He or she encountered suffering. Along with that suffering that this bodhisattva witnessed everywhere, he or she encountered the deeper connection between me and everybody. Not just every people, but all beings. And seeing that connection and seeing the suffering the Bodhisattva said, I can't just let that be. Kind of par for the course. I can't let that be business as usual. I have to do something about it. I can't just let it go. I need to get involved to relieve the suffering, said the Bodhisattva. And with that thought in mind, it became necessary to go out and learn ways to make it hurt less for people that the Bodhisattva saw that she was connected to. Otherwise, it's just too cruel. You have to harden your heart. You have to get very callous in order to see all that suffering go down and just say, yeah, that's how it is. Or worse, add to it. 
right? So with that in mind, as the key, as the framework for this whole thing, suddenly a lot of the bodhisattva's behavior makes sense. Oh, now I see. So the bodhisattva woke up to that, that people who he or she cares about deeply are hurting, wanted to do something about it, and started to learn the Buddha's methods for ending suffering. Okay of which there are many. And the Buddha mastered them and is willing to share them. If only we put ourselves in a position to be able to learn them. Hence, contemplating the realms of things that open the measure, expand the measure of your mind. Like what? Like empty space. Like consciousness itself. Like what? Desire, form, formlessness, etc. So those are the things the Bodhisattva is contemplating. When you turn over to page 6 and 7, we've got 10 more. 10 more mindsets that the Bodhisattva fits into his or her consciousness so as to to do what? These are 10 kinds of wisdom that make dharmas grow. And to go over all ten would, would take us past our time tonight. But this is what we did as we, you know, studied the, the fourth ground over these last months, these last six months or so. They are keeping a profound attitude of non-retreat, never going back, never quitting. And by doing that, the, the hallmark of these was the Bodhisattva is reborn in the Tathagat family. You recall that, people who were here? This Bodhisattva is reborn in the Buddha's household by holding these ten contemplations, ten more contemplations. Faith in the three jewels, the three gems that is never destroyed, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Contemplating how all things that we do arise and cease. If you've been part of a Vipassana 10 day, you heard about that one. Rising, falling, rising, falling. All things, all deeds come into being and pass away. Nothing lasts. Interesting, right? How this goes deep, how the intrinsic nature of all dharmas does not arise in the first place. Whoops. Can that coexist with the previous one? If all things come into being and pass away, how can their intrinsic nature never be born in the first place? Well, understand this is not theory. This is not the Buddha's proposition for debate. This is his experience. And when we put our minds in this place of the fourth stage bodhisattva, it's your experience. So this is a lab manual. This is lab notes, laboratory notes that the, bodhis- that the Buddha passed on as he passed through the fourth stage, fourth ground. That's helpful. This is a tech manual. This is not a book to be sold or a theory to be debated. The Buddha said this is what happens at this stage of concentration when your mind does what mine has done and what yours will do as you progress through this level of meditation. That's a different perspective, isn't it? This is what you're holding in your hands is it could be, you know, a dock for operating your vacuum cleaner. It's that factual. It's that much not open to theory. It's how it works. How what works? How this works when it's subjected to the transformations of the Buddha's practice. Interesting. It's very precise, scientific, empirical instructions for becoming a four-stage bodhisattva. How come we don't know it? Well, who's walked the the first, second, third stage to get to the fourth stage? When we do, this opens up. All right, moving forward, 10 mindsets, to page 14. This is what Helen was pointing to. 10 more shin The 
bodhisattva obtains, look at this list. A kind, nourishing mind. A compliant, yielding mind. A mind that blends and accords. A mind that serves and makes happy. A mind undefiled. A mind that seeks the highest supreme dharma. A mind that seeks the highest wisdom. A mind that wants to rescue beings in all worlds. A mind that reveres honored virtuous ones and does not oppose the teachings and instructions. And a mind that accords with the Dharma that she has heard and skillfully cultivates all of them. Mindsets. Okay. This is progressive. As a result of having done the, the 20 contemplations, getting those mindsets, now this Bodhisattva, the verb was Where did we get our Rusha Arda? Let's see. Pusa si Pusa Sui So Chu Fan Bian Hui Xiu Xi Yu Dao Yi Zhu Dao Fan Rusha Arda. So these are the results of all that work. You you're you've now changed. You're different now. Having done all that. And you're ready for the fourth ground. You're prepared. The Garden has been rototillered, has been the the bigger clods have been spaded into smaller clods, and the smaller clods have been amended with compost, and this soil is ready for the seeds of the fourth ground. Okay, so far so good. Turn back, please, page twenty four twenty five. How interesting to look at this as a tech manual. This is the doc file that you download, right? This is the PDF. The fourth ground is a PDF, how to. It's actually that. Should you choose to do this, here's how. It's not an opinion. All right. The Bodhisattva perfects all of these. Line three, last line at the very bottom of page 24. He or she intently seeks Buddhahood and never tires or wearies. The Chinese, word for word, focuses, concentrates, seeks Dao, the Buddha's Dao. That's the word of Dao, path, Taoism, same word. It's a loaded, powerful, Chinese um, spiritual term that Taoists and Buddhists and Confucians all share. And it can be translated as road. This is the, he walks, she walks the Buddha's road, seeking this road. Wu and Jen never gets fed up, never gets tired, never says, enough, I'm out of here. This simply doesn't work. Will, willpower, intention, qi, expecting, wanting, to kind of get the call, we say, to receive the entrustment, to du zhongsheng, Buddhist jargon language, to take a cross. That's the du of. To, to ferry over, to move across, to change, to transform, to teach. Uh, Christian language, to save. Ha ha, watch out. Right? Hallelujah. So, to save living beings. It's not entirely wrong, but it's different. Why? Saving implies that something has been done to you. And here, the Bodhisattva sets up the conditions for beings to cross over, but there's no power by which the bodhisattva crosses over living being. We still have to do it. Okay? They say the teacher leads you to the gate. Whether you enter is up to you. Shifu lin jin man xiu xing zai gu ren. So, interesting here. This is tech talk. This is... This is Buddhist chop talk, we need to unpack these terms. But 
what I wanted to uh, point to is the reason for line three. And the reason for line three is in line four. How does the bodhisattva keep going when, without getting tired or, or fatigued? Um, people will come to you if you're in my robes, in my shoes, and they'll say, in my sandals, and they'll say, huh, what a waste of time. Who's ever met a Buddha? You ever seen one? You ever hear of anybody getting enlightened? And, you know, kind of like tossing a, tossing a worm out to see if the fish will bite. And if you thought about that, you could get very discouraged. Because right? it's so complicated. As soon as somebody comes up and says, you know, I am enlightened, immediately you have to be suspicious. <laughs> you, you have to question somebody who would make the claim that so-and-so is enlightened. Well, what about if he doesn't say it, but his disciples do? You know, our teacher is enlightened. You know, yeah, you better be careful. So how confusing is that? Why are we working so hard and being so vigorous chasing a perfection that you can't even claim. A perfection that in the Buddhist literature itself says there is no knowing and no attaining. There's nothing to get in the first place. Go. What a waste of time. Right? How airy-fairy is that when you deconstruct your own goal? That's either bogus or right on. Profound. Right? I mean, there's some serious doubts built right in there, right? Unless you see it from the point of view of the Dharma. And so I'm just saying, right? How does the Bodhisattva never get tired of something that is so obscure as that? Michael, are you... Are you did you have, no, no, okay, good. I, I thought you might be requesting an opportunity. Would you like to speak on this question? Okay. So, excellent, excellent. I was just picking up that often people will put their palms together to say, call on me. So I was, just in case, just in case. That's right. Buddhists don't, we, we, we do this, right? <laughs> call on me, call on me. How does it work that something as obscure and amorphous as this is the goal? Mm. It's either very airy-fairy or just too glib to be real right? or useful. No, not. That's not the way to see it that I think makes sense to me. The notion is this. The Buddha's discovery was that he and we, by extension, he being a, a human, did not lack the Buddha nature in any way. He came to life as Siddhartha fully endowed with the Buddha nature, not lacking it by the slightest. The problem is that because we are, quote, sentient beings, living beings, we run outside of that Buddha nature, propelled by what? By greed, anger, and delusion, and mistake the direction of the search. Looking outside for awakening is 180 degrees wrong. And the world, the marketplace, and just this world that we're in now, leads us out and rewards us for running outside. Grab for all the gusto you can get. Budweiser. Right? We, it, currently in Taiwan, if you don't have a Ming Pai handbag, you are nobody. And a Ming Pai handbag can be any one. Hermes is currently leading, and Louis Vuitton is second, I guess. And they're so valuable that people will sell their bodies to get enough wherewithal to get uh, Hermes or Louis Vuitton a handbag, or they will buy a clever Chinese knockoff, right? 
And there's this huge market in counterfeit Ming Pai, name brand bags. That's called running outside, running in the wrong direction, right? And by golly, we do it. The marketplace pulls us out. The Buddha said, I've looked through the forest for six years and found all these teachers teaching remarkable ways to, to promise great rewards, standing on one leg, you know, walking over a bed of nails, mm. hanging upside down from tree branches, fasting until you're so skinny you can see every bone and every vein. All of them lead 180 degrees away from the right direction. They pull you out. And it was only after he resolved to find the middle way and reverse that search that he started to remove the coverings from what was already awake and slowly, painfully, bit by bit, after 49 days, removing the final awake and he became the Buddha. Literally, got nothing. He uncovered his accomplishment. So in the Buddha Dharma, you make progress by subtraction. The less ignorance you have, the more awakening, the more bodhi you realize. It's one to one. And so when you finally succeed, you didn't get anything. You got rid of the stuff that covers over our nature. That's a very important flip, a very important turning around. And thereby, somebody who says, I'm enlightened, I'm awake, has a, a self, one layer, has something to get, another layer, and shouldn't be trusted with your spiritual future, right? Good, congratulations, bless you, Omi Tofo, you know. Good luck. We're all here suffering more or less, you know, depending on whether we've got that the right direction. So that's how you can say that the Bodhisattva never gets weary or tired of helping people wake up because he, she has now connected with Tong Ti Da Bei, same body, great compassion. Identifies that all beings are in the same boat, stumbling in the dark, kind of waking up and vigorously looking within and then getting pulled out again into relationships, into dead end jobs, into pursuit for fame, comfort. And then we wake up, we get tired of that, and we wake up again, and we're back in the dark. And seeing that says, mm, my work's not done. How can I quit? How could I get tired? Could a mom, would a mom ever say, this child is too much trouble. I'm not paying attention to you anymore. You're on your own. I'm not curious what you had for dinner. I'm not even checking to see if you're eating your greens. Don't call me in the middle of the night with sob stories about how he said this to you, right? I'm not listening to you anymore. Would a mom say those kind of things? No, moms don't. My mom, bless her heart, 90 years old, wants to know what I ate. She hasn't let that go, you know? And I go, mom, you know, you've been here. You know how they feed me. <laughs> I never don't have enough to eat, mom. Why don't you? What did you eat, Mom? Well, um, they, you know, um, I've been lactose intolerant for some time, so I've been trying to get enough soy protein, and uh, it doesn't taste very good, but I like it better than what the milk does to my stomach. So, you know, good, Mom. You know, I'll send you plenty of soy <laughs> protein. You can, that good. But she, she, that thought occurs. Why? She connects my well-being with her well-being. Just like who? Right? So the role of the mom and that maternal connection that doesn't get tired 
is a really good analogy for how the Bodhisattva identifies other beings' well-being with her own, his own well-being. It's the same. There's no thought of, oh, well, let him go. Right? So how amazing is this Bodhisattva's heart that sees that connection and doesn't have a thought in between of too much trouble. These bodhisattvas are too much trouble. And while we don't do politics from this seat, I was concerned last week to hear, now who's laughing at me? I, I'm, I am not going to do politics from this seat. When I heard that Meals on Wheels was part of the budget sequester cuts, something in my heart went, Some old person who may be your mom, your dad, your uncle, your aunt, whose knees don't work now as well and they're on the third floor and they can't get down to the store because it takes them an hour to get down three flights with their walker, will not get their hot meal delivered to them as the money was there to fund the program that was working barely but were still in place. Has now those funds have been cut? Why? For doctrinal purity. Because we know government's bad. And we have legislators in our Congress, bless their hearts, who are determined to purify our thinking about government. Never mind that that means dad, grandpa won't get his hot meal today. You go, there's a lot of ignorance happening there. Someone is cut off from the reality of our connection and suffering. You go, wait till you are that person on the third floor with bad knees and can't get to the store anymore except for an hour down three flights and the elevator's out. And how will you feel? You will be suffering. Why increase suffering? Let the money from your tax dollars go to remove suffering from elders. Are you not going to get old? Think. Understand it. See it the way it really is. And you go, gee whiz, that's a lot of suffering. You know? And I, I s heard that news, and that's one of many, many, many. Do you like your state parks? Sorry. Those funds, the, the national parks that, that come down to the are those parks will be padlocked and dark. No toilet paper in the bathrooms. No leaf removal from the parking lot. Why? Funds are cut. Do you like your parks? I do. But sorry for doctrinal purity that says government's bad, we shut them. <laughs> Trouble there. You know, there's some issues about this I right here. There's unclarity about suffering and its cause. When you bring it all back, we all move out from that Buddha nature into more or less confusion, more or less coverings. The thing about the Bodhisattva and why we bother to open these ancient texts on Saturday night is because here's somebody who has identified the right direction is looking in the right place. And then, from that place, goes out to, to make a difference. So that when we say, yeah, greed, anger, and delusion, pride and doubt, five fundamental afflictions, cover over that nature. And when I see it, I'm, nothing is the same after that. I can't be content with just letting it hurt more you know, that's a profound moment. This is a very unselfish, sharing person whose life is devoted to service. Right? Bodhisattva says, yeah, I'm going to wake up because I'm in the right direction, but I'm going to do what I can with my body, mouth, and mind to help other folks wake up. Why? Because I'm related to them. That's my family out there. So... Okie doke.
determined to ascend to rescue living beings. All right? Now, we said it, we started that we're going to wind up at 9 tonight because it's going to be a very early morning on the road heading up to city of 10,000 Buddhas um, to observe Master Hua's demise, 1995. So you have in your um, songbook beside you there, page 92, Dedication of Merit, in the back. It's interactive, that is to say, um, as you um, use your mind to share the, um, the goodness that comes from joining together with Dharma friends, you use your mind to send that out um, with a wish to benefit. This is an organic device and the weather upstairs is warmer than the weather in the Buddha hall and change the tuning. How about that? one time in its brief life this was a tree so it uh, responds and the tuning changes and it sounds much better in tune so anyway uh, take that goodness from joining together with wholesome Dharma friends and send it out with your mind you actually put into practice this notion of connection through sending out along the neural networks, mayhem, maybe? Maybe some ancient DNA code. Who knows exactly how the transference works, but it certainly does work. Um, send out the goodness with a wish. Take your merit, your virtue, and send it out to all beings. And the wish is yours. However you want to dedicate that merit, um, please do send it out. Mm, you can connect through your family, through ancestors, through the beings with whom you're connected through the earth you're sitting on. However you choose to do it, we dedicate the merit. So please make a wish and let's do it together. Leave their grief and pain 
pay this boundless light Break the darkness of their endless night Because our hearts are one This world of pain turns into paradise May all become compassionate and wise May all become compassionate and wise So we're um, delighted to be expanding our family here to include uh, Michael, who's come all the way from London to be with us, and uh, Jason, who came all the way from India, from India, to be with us, but not for long. He's going up to Oregon. And... Some folks who walked all the way over from Alston, Addison, Shattuck, from Shattuck. Not a small effort. So, anyway. Tomorrow, um, anyone who's going up to CTTB, City of 10,000 Buddhas, um, I think the festivities there begin at, um, you may know for sure, you may see the announcement. Minghe Shamsho Kaisha. 7 30 or 8? 7? 7 o'clock, yeah. Uh, we won't be there for the beginning. <coughs> uh, we'll be a little later. But there's uh, bowing to Master Shenhua. There's uh, a chance to look at his sharira, his relics. Then um, there's the Chuan Gong, where you pass the, the 108 offerings from hand to hand throughout the assembly, and they're put up front. It's quite spectacular. And many of our community are up there preparing 108 offering plates. It's quite something. Then um, there will be a, a vegetarian feast. Lots and lots of people. I mean, many buses tomorrow going up. This, this has become the number one event. Oh, we have a whole family from, from Orange County who have come with us. See us uh, every... Uh, Every year or so, we get to see them once, and this is it, so welcome. Um, now you know we're webcasting every Saturday night. We want to see you online every week. Don't miss. Right? All right. No excuse. So um, then there will be um, an afternoon. A uh, lot of uh, the summer camp starts tomorrow, so all the kids will be coming for summer camp. Lots of stuff. I am going tomorrow afternoon to Abayagiri Forest Monastery for an ordination of a new bhikkhu who's going through, which is lovely. I'll be on the platform on a mountain top in central Mendocino County uh, at 5 p.m. It'll be quite an event. Then uh, we're webcasting tomorrow night's lecture from CTTB's Buddha Hall for the first among the first times, but with our new equipment. So if anybody wants to plug in, do you know what network? Is it, is it Dharma Realm Live? D, DRBA Live, Dharma Realm Live. Dharma Realm Live. How do, how do people find it? How will they? Okay. That's DRBA.org is, is up. Okay. Go to DRBA.org. Tomorrow night, around 8 o'clock, and uh, you will hear me sitting in the city of 10,000 Buddhas, 10,000 Buddhas Hall, um, talking about mm, the monasteries, the history of our, of our monasteries in brief. We'll be talking about the ordination coming up. We'll be talking about the novices and, uh, at CTTB, our, our ordination. It'll be happening in August and a few other choice topics, but I'll be mostly storytelling tomorrow night. And you can catch it from 8 to 9. We'd appreciate it if you would log on. You'll boost our stats. And uh, you'll hear some great stories. So, 
If it's a success, we will be doing it regularly. And it should have been done a long time ago because uh, there's so much that Buddha Hall is always active. And wouldn't it be nice if you could reliably around the world tune in to 4 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and do morning chanting with the monks and nuns? Why not? You know. So um, we're putting our tech tools to the test tomorrow night. History is being made, by golly. So we'll see how it goes. If all is well, we'll cross our fingers. So then, um, this coming week, um, let's see. Uh, Ashing Fosher, do you want to say something about our Sunday morning walks starting next week? So our regularly scheduled Wednesday and Friday night meditation classes, the Friday night is going to be moved to Tuesday. So this being Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So if you are Chan B group, then come Tuesday night because Friday night we have uh, uh, a change. So that's just this week. Following week, it'll be back on schedule. At all. Because the Chan meditation teacher will be on retreat. In New York State. Okay. So we'll announce, we'll get all that clear. But in general, this week come Tuesday. Now, the other thing that Dashing Fosher said, he didn't have his mic, so I'll repeat just so people can hear. Um, we did the first pilot program last Sunday morning of uh, meditating and walking in nature. The, the Bay Area is blessed with this extensive regional park system. I don't know if people are aware that from... Richmond and Contra Costa all the way down to Fremont and I guess close to San Jose, we have a long line of regional parks. It's something like the third largest in area in America, I think. We're, and it's uh, Tilden and then Briones and then uh, Fremont. These various ranges are all linked in a, a continuous north-south line of, of regional parks. They're beautiful. They include... Uh, several peaks and not very tall but still for since we're at sea level they're, they're pretty nice and they're open and available for people to enjoy although with the sequester budget we'll see Jerry Brown has his heart in the right place and he'll probably fight to keep them open anyway Master Dashing took meditators out last Sunday morning on a walk a meditation and then some stretching and moving meditation and uh, so alternating walking and sitting under trees near uh, Lake Jewel, is Jewel Lake or Lake Anza? Lake Anza, which is extremely beautiful in the morning with the mist on it, um, reflecting like a mirror but with a layer of clouds, just very pristine. Um, and it was popular enough that we decided to do it every Sunday morning through July and August, starting July and August. So... Uh, keep, keep tuned in for that, those announcements. Um, it, it was really quite nice, and so we're going to do it again every Sunday. Coming up. All right. I think that's it for the announcements. And if you go up tomorrow morning, drive mindfully, and we'll see you at CTTB. Otherwise, we'll see you back here next Saturday night for 
Further Adventures of the Fourth Stage Bodhisattva. We'll bow to the Buddhas and end. to the Venerable Master. Oh.